South Africa. Welcome to Afternoon Express. I'm Bonnie Bully. Today we explore the literary world and we've got two young authors joining us in the loft. Firstly, we've got Dudu Basani Dube who created the Choma Trilogy. And then we chat to singer and debut author Carol Mohale Mashikha, also known as Black Porcelain, who has written a book called The Yearning. We're also joined by inspiring Pearl Siegel who was involved in a terrible car accident many years ago which left her paralyzed. And now she's a businesswoman and motivational speaker and she recently released a book about what she's learned on her journey. Finally, we take a trip to Durban to meet up with former model and now fashion mentor Derek Mthongo. It's all happening on Afternoon Express today. Jeannie is making us something sweet. Thank you, Bon Bizzle, and welcome to Afternoon Express. So great to be on the show today. And uh, I, we're going to be baking something absolutely delicious today with my absolutely gorgeous co-baker, uh, which is food, food blogger Ming Chow Lin. Ming, welcome. Hi, Jeannie. I'm always very excited to have you on the show. Usually Thanks, you, you make really traditional yes. stuff for us, but today we are going pastry and tasty yes something Morning, sweet we're going to be making honeycomb which is one of my favorite things um my fiance is a scientist so we often bake together because it's a combination of science and food exactly and also having studied patisserie and um, it's one of my favorite things to do is to make pastry and to work with desserts um it's intricate it's delicate it's pretty you know well because he's a scientist does he come up with his own recipes then with like a scientific N base not necessarily he kind of needs to follow it's, okay. you know, th there's, there's steps, there's <laughs> methods, and that's how a scientist's brain usually works. Okay, well, I definitely need to know how to follow the steps and the method to this delicious treat that we're going to be making today. And you can too. Remember to, uh, to visit our website, afternoonexpress.co.za, for today's recipe and, of course, all of the shopping ingredients. But for now, Bonnie's on the couch with our first guest. She's a journalist by profession, but her novels are the reason why she's joining us in the loft today. Viewed as a writer for the... For everyday women, her novels have gained a huge following. Her trilogy called the Thomo series has been described sort of as a South African Fifty Shades of Grey. Joining us in the loft is author and journalist Dudu Usani Dube. Welcome to the loft, Dudu. Thank you, Bonnie. Yeah, lovely to have you. So, you're a journalist and then you started writing. I've spoken to many journalists who find it hard to transition from journalists to just writing books and most of them have that dream to write. How did you find your process? Well, for me, I started journalism because I wanted to write. Mm -hmm. Writing was my first passion. I mean, the, the, the main reason I went for journalism, is, it was because I was told I could write by, by my teacher in high school. So it took me long. I started working at about 22. So I only wrote my first book uh, when I was uh, 32. That was two years ago. So I worked for 12 years as a journalist until I could find... Uh, the way to balance my time because it's a demanding job on its own, but Very you, know, much. you write for a living, so you get used to it. So I started writing uh, in between work, but I, I I would work during the day and then write in the afternoon. But uh, you know, journalism is a career, but writing is, and it's totally it's, it's a two different and things. Love. Yeah, exactly. It's reporting and writing a book, especially fiction, it's two different things. Yeah. So, but, you know, it, it happened. It, it's what I wanted to do, so I did it. Well, congratulations. Thank so you. your, your trilogy, the Thomo series, what inspired it? Which one was the first, second, and respectively the third book, and what were they about? Well, the first book, uh, I always struggle with that question when people ask me what inspired it, because I really don't know. The book is just basically about a girl who goes through a lot of, of things uh, over 12 years. You know, it starts when she's young, she meets a guy who is a little below her, you know, status level of life. Uh -huh. And uh, she, he is dark in, a, in, a, in, a, you know, in an African kind of way. But you know, she finds, uh, she, she loves him. And she finds herself stuck in a, I think that it, it happens with everyone. You have this person who is, everything you want, but the, there's that but one not thing in love with him. that is wrong <laughs> with them. So you have to make a choice whether you take them as they are or yeah. you leave them yeah. for that one thing. That's the story of uh, Shobu and Mkhele. He is, uh, not going to go deep into details. You know, everybody, all, all the women that have read the books love it, but, you know, there's a but. So I think it's, 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 it's how life is, you know, right, there's always right. going to be that path yeah. and you have to make a choice. Yeah. What are the themes of all the three books that like are, are resonant in all three of them? And do they have a personal relevance to you? Because often writers write from what they know, <laughs> from what they want the world to know about 
what they think of the world. Well, they are all pure fiction, but everybody... Pure fiction. Yeah, <laughs> they're fiction. Every, you know, people ask, uh, people think that the, 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 the people in the book do really exist, but I don't know them. You know, if I, if I, if I could bring them to life, I would. But it's about uh, a family. It's, uh, it's, it's about uh, brothers. There's, there's eight of them. They come from a uh, great town in Wazulu Natal. You know, in the 90s, during the political violence, their parents were killed because their father was a warlord. So they ran away and they survived. And uh, they ended up in Joburg in the taxi business. And uh, they are very, very, you know, uh, brutal. Mm -hmm. in a kind of way, but you know, it's it's their past has a lot to do with with how they turn out. They yeah. had to survive, so yeah. they went to the dark side of life. So it's about that. But the stories are the first book, Shlomo. The story is told by Shlomo, who ends up being one of the brothers' wives, and the second book, Zadile, is uh, also told by the wife of, yes, of one of the brothers, yes. and the third one. But they're all different women married to... And you've decided men. to write all the books in a from a first-person perspective. I did, I did. Why was that the particular choice in all three of them? I wanted to, you know, uh, uh, writing in first person because you become the character. You mm. know, it's, it's very... Uh, you are able to express the emotions as you write. You know, when I was mm. writing Klobo, I was Klobo, so I was able to ex express what she felt exactly as it was. I also think that that's, that's for the writer, but also for the reader. They become the character as they, as they read the books. They go through emotions with her because, you know, there's no that in between. I mean, if you write in third person, there seems to be like somebody in between the reader and the character. Hmm. Somebody telling the story, relating the story between them. But also, you know, writing in first person is, is it's fun. You know, I, fun? I, you know, in the way I, I mean, if Shlomo is angry, she says, ha, you know, in, in the yeah. book. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I enjoy it. Uh, but I'm not saying that I'm going to be writing in first person for, you know, for, for the ever. rest of my writing. <laughs> You're obviously <laughs> going to be writing for the rest of your life. I, I, you plan it's, to? It's go, It's therapy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's therapy. You know, it does. It 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 works for me. So you chose to go the self-publishing route and without a publisher or an agent. Uh, I mean, that's quite a route to go. Well, and what are some of the challenges along that road? Ah, uh, there are there are a lot of of challenges. It is it is costly, first of all, because you have to do everything yourself from your own pocket. Yep. And it is ah. Uh, you know, you are, you go out there, nobody knows you, and you have a book, and, uh, you know, they're going to look at you like... Uh, yeah. How did you tackle uh, issues like marketing and distribution? Uh, marketing, social media is... It is the best thing that it's has key. ever happened to anyone. In to anyone. <laughs> so that's where... <laughs> that's where, But I started by blogging. I blogged uh, my first book. Um, almost 30 chapters of it, and there was the response was so huge that wow. you know, it was so huge that I, I I had to put it in a book and I had to sell it. And even when I was selling it, a lot of people bought, a lot of people bought it. But also, you know, my friends and my family have been, you know, supportive. Yeah, they've yeah. they've just been there. I don't think without them, you know, I wouldn't have been able to have three books by now. Wow. You know, they just. Got in there, my colleagues, everybody. Oh, that's incredible. Well, congratulations again. <laughs> Thank you. After the break, we're showing you how to make dark Muscovado honeycomb with apple pastry discs. And we chat to singer and debut author Carol Mashejo about her book, The Yearning. Remember to answer our question for the day. We want to know what book should everyone read once in their life and why? Tweet us at Afternoon Chat using our official hashtag Afternoon Express. Comment on our Facebook page or give us a call live on 083-913-3728. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back to Afternoon Express. Now, the days are counting down and it's less than a week left until the start of the third season of Winner Home right here on Afternoon Express. Now, you get to follow our three young designers every weekday from the 16th of May as they turn three empty apartments into dream homes. They've got expert colour advice from Plascon to create on-trend living spaces and, of course, luxurious Caesar stone surfaces, all at the award-winning Val de Vie estate, conveniently located in the Cape Winelands. Now, if you enter this grand prize competition on privateproperty.co.za, 
you, the viewer, stand a chance to win one of the completed apartments. I mean, that's incredible. When a Home is proudly brought to you by private property in proud association with Nedbank. Now, from when a Home to Honeycomb, how do we get started with this delicious treat? Um, so, okay, well, first thing we do is to get the sugar. Now, muscovada sugar is really, really nice and dark. So instead of making a traditional golden honeycomb, we're going to be making something a little bit darker, a little bit earthier, which is kind of naughty, which okay. is always fun. Yeah, we'll call um, it rustic. Just we'll call it fashionable. rustic. So <laughs> the first thing you do is to measure out 200 grams and then you pop it onto the stove top. So now, usually you use caster sugar, which is a lot finer, but because muscovada has such a beautiful, dark, earthy flavour mm. to it, we are going to be using it instead. And very caramelly yes, as well. Yes, exactly. I'm so glad you know how to work that, because I thought <laughs> you were going to ask me now. Actually, <laughs> I, I might be asking you. This is your kitchen. <laughs> no, 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 it's on, it's on, it's, it's on. on. You're good. Yeah, oh, awesome. check, it's blue. Ta-da! Oh, red. <gasps> okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure of having to turn the stove on. <laughs> so, okay. Now, in addition, you're also going to add five tablespoons of either honey or syrup or glucose. Okay. So it's basically just something to get it going and to mix together. So you let, add that yeah, to fine. your sugar. Okay. And then you just need to make sure to mix it around until it melts. All now, right. obviously, that takes a little bit of time, which usually is around <laughs> three minutes or so. Um, you need to let it reach 150 degrees Celsius. So what we decided to do is to pre-make. There you go. And let Done. it bubble away beautifully. So in three minutes, that will look like that? It should, yes. Okay. yes. So now what you like to do as well is you want to keep the temperature a little bit lower as well. So you let it rise slowly. Otherwise, when it actually reaches 150 degrees, it's, it's going to go too far ahead once you take it off the stove. And so okay. we actually might come out with a burnt product. So is this is ideal. why baking is a science. Yes, it's, it's got to be much. exact. Okay, so when it forms these nice, beautiful bubbles, okay, and we're just going to turn this off. We are going to add the bicarbonate of soda. So now the whole idea behind this is to make sure that it goes as fast as you can. And then you watch it rise. <laughs> and that's what gets that bubbliness, beautiful that fluffiness. Bubbliness. And as soon as you go, then you pour it out. Good girl. Okay. What I like to do with the extras, I like to stick my whisk in and just like double along the side. Then you get like little pieces of candy as well with it. Oh, that's excellent. It's quite fun. So now. This was really so simple. So basically, so simple. Honey, honeycomb is essentially just sugar. <laughs> exactly. And, and you can make so many nice desserts with it as well. And we're going to be using it as a topping for a little bit later, which is going to be quite fun. Um, so what you'd want to do now is you need to let it cool. It takes about an hour or so to let it cool down. Otherwise, you won't have all those beautiful little bubbles and it will be soft. And that's not exactly how you want it. You want it to have this nice hard crack. So afterwards, we get to play and bash it up a little bit. OK. How long does this need to set for? Um, an hour. Oh, really? Yes. And it can just stay out here? You don't need to just put it in the fridge or freezer or no. anything like that? It basically just needs to harden, so all the little bubbles will be formed on the inside of the honeycomb, and yeah, okay. you just yeah, treat yourself afterwards with that. Fantastic. Remember, baking is a science, so you need to follow the recipe word for word to get it exactly right. But luckily, if you visit afternoonexpress.co.za, everything is there for you, and I think this is going to be a really tasty treat, for, especially now for winter. <laughs> We want to eat all those bad things. But for now, Bonnie's going to be back on the couch and uh, we'll finish up with this a little bit later. The Yearning is the debut novel by multidisciplinary artist Carol Mojale Mashejo. It's an exploration of the ripple effects of the past, of personal strength and courage, and of the shadowy intersections of traditional and modern worlds. Apart from writing, Carol is also a singer-songwriter under the stage name Black Porcelain. Welcome to The Loft, Carol. Thanks for having me. Yeah, lovely to have you too. So I was at your book launch in Cape Town the other night. How did it go according to you? Well, I'd never had a book launch before, so, <laughs> so you had nothing to compare it to. <laughs> nothing to compare it to. But I was like, let me be really smart and say... And you really were. You were funny <laughs> and you were just witty and charismatic. I don't know about smart, but yes, I suppose then I was myself, which is basically messy and entertaining for other people. Yeah. Tell us about The Yearning. So The Yearning is, is the about? story of uh, Marubini. 
and she's living a seemingly perfect life. She's got a seemingly perfect boyfriend, but things start to fall apart and she starts to feel like she's losing her mind a little bit. And she's certain that her mom knows why, but no one is telling her anything. And uh, she thinks it's related to the brutal murder of her father. And that's really all I can say. Wow. And the intersection between these traditional and modern worlds, is this a, a, a cultural experience? What, what are your... Wh which premise are you coming from about it? Well, I think I always... I, you know, I, I think there are very few black people that live in South Africa mm -hmm. that don't know about assimilation. And I, I suppose it seems like traditional and modern worlds for other people, but for me it's... It's how we've all lived. You know, you can live Likoko somewhere in the rural areas and then that's during school holidays and yeah. then you live in the modern world where you're, you know, you're going to school in the suburbs or whatever. So mm -hmm. it's just about how she was a child that was living in a traditional world yes. and then now she's a woman living in a modern yeah. world. How did the writing of the book impact you and change your life? Because it, it genuinely just does. I think you're never the same after you've <laughs> written a book. Well, one, I knew that I could actually finish. So that was good. That's incredible. Then I, yeah, yeah, I had more faith in myself. But I think it was some, for, so, some form of therapy for me, almost. Because she goes through so much heavy stuff, and I wanted to be able to say, well, how, how do I describe spiritual pain in a physical hmm. way? Hmm. And it, for me, anyway, it was a way to be like, I struggle so much to tell people that, hey, I have anxiety and depression, and I don't know how to describe it. So if I had the opportunity, how would I describe it as physical pain? Wow. And you, uh, Ruby, your, your central character, is, goes through a lot of panic attacks. And the way you describe the panic attacks is quite harrowing. Took me back to my own panic attacks. And, and were you drawing from your own experience of them? Oh, definitely. The panic attacks, yes, because I had my first panic attack when I was 17. And, I and did you know what sure, it was? No. I thought I was dying. It was, I think it was after school and I was waiting for my parents and I was like, I'm legit having a heart attack here. This is not normal. Wow. What was it about waiting for your parents after school do you think that brought that on? <laughs> what was it? I don't know. I don't think... Because I think I died a few times every time I waited for my mom to come and pick me up oh. and she just came like seven hours later. I know. And everyone's <laughs> gone home and you're right? like, who am I supposed to talk to, mom? Who am I supposed to talk to here? <laughs> yeah, so it was that. It was yeah. my, my own experience with anxiety and depression that informed how to best describe the spiritual pain in a physical way. Yeah. How long did it take you to write the book? Because you, you you said you first started writing the book and then you stopped halfway and then you started another book. Yeah, so I started writing it in 2006 because I was working in advertising and it's a job that I hated. I'm very honest about that. <laughs> and I just started writing to kind of avoid my colleagues, really. So I'd just be sitting at my computer and somebody would come over, I'd be like, ah, ah, no, no. <laughs> busy with something. And then I abandoned it when I started working in radio. Because, because there was something you loved. I and know. still love. I was happy, so I didn't want to write anymore. And then I think in 2010, I started writing what is now my second manuscript. And my best friend said to me, you'll never finish this one if you didn't finish the first one. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, oh, whatever, fine, I'll finish it for you. Yeah. And then it took me about two and a half years to finally get to the complete manuscript where I was like, hey, publishers, look at me, I did a thing. And what was that journey like, looking for a publisher? Because, I mean, the cover of your book is beautiful. And then I read that excerpt written by Zeg Smita, and I was like, gasp. Zeg Smita <laughs> is like a literary legend, genius, like Adonis, all of it. What did that feel like, him reading your book and saying that about your book? Well, okay, so Zeg says, I joke, he's my BFF, but so I knew him oh, when I was... Oh, okay, I can die now. <laughs> Sex is my PFF. <laughs> I met him when I was working in radio and um, we started emailing and then he had a launch here and or he was getting a doctor or something but he said won't you come along and I was like oh my gosh and then we kind of stayed in touch so when I'd finished this I said oh do you know what I wrote a thing can you just read it you... and just tell me is it bad and then he read it and he was like you have to get this published so I was like ah oh, you're just being nice because you wow. might be a fan. Wow, that's incredible. He's a very nurturing man. I remember after I published my book, he, he tweeted me and said, oh, this is an incredible book and you have to carry on like writing. And hearing that from like legend like him meant that I couldn't stop, but like I try to stop every now and then. But anyway. Never stop, never stop. <laughs> what is your writing process? I don't actually Do you just have a sit writing down, process. Open your computer and just start writing. Yeah, like if that's somebody is watching much it. us right now and they're like, I want to learn how to write, I think I can write, where do they start? 
start with the first word. Seriously, wherever you are, if you have a piece of paper or whatever, just write. It'll eventually come together, even if you don't write it in the order that it's going to be published. Just write. I don't have a process. If I'm sitting down for long enough, even on my phone, I'll start like writing a paragraph. I'm like, what is this? Where does it belong? Am I... Am I writing something or is it just for fun? Yeah. What have been your friends and your family's reaction to your book? I mean, are they reading this like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Is there anything you want to talk to us about? Like, have there been like any like reactions? Well, I think my dad was the first person yeah. besides my best friend who'd read it. And yeah. he was like, wow, you can actually write. Right. I yeah. was like, thank you, Papa. Yes. I, I'm, I'm writing words. Uh, he was very surprised because I don't think my family knew that I, I write as such. Yeah. And my friends that have read it have said, we had no idea you had so much talent and I don't know how to take that. Wow. Yeah, you were like, you didn't know I was talented all so along. So you just you thought, thought me I'm the just... whole life. <laughs> but I was chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us. I can't wait to read your book and uh, all the best. Thank you very much. Later on in the show, we'll be giving away copies of all the books we're chatting about today and talking of books. Remember to answer our question for the day. We want to know which books should everyone read once in their life and why. Tweet us at Afternoon Chat using our official hashtag Afternoon Express. Comment on our Facebook page or give us a call live on 083-913-3728. We'd love to hear from you. After the break, we chat to Pearl Siegel, who turned her life around after suffering a near-fatal car accident, recently published a book about the lessons she has learned. Don't go away. Welcome back to Afternoon Express. Now, years ago, Pearl Siegel survived a serious motor vehicle accident. Initially, she was paralyzed, but able to rehabilitate to an extent. With unrelenting tenacity, strength, and courage, she graduated with a master's degree in business leadership. And now she's written a book called Seven Tried and Tested Triangles, which is the fruition of many years she spent in personal change mode, and blends personal life skills with business knowledge and helps improve a person's abilities to adapt and change. Welcome to The Laughed Pearl Siegel. Wow, what an introduction. Thank you, Jeannie. I'm delighted to be here and meet you in person. Oh, <laughs> thank you. But what a life. I mean, what happened? What led you to, to becoming paralysed? Um, I was involved in a serious motor vehicle accident yeah. and I had a C1 fracture. So initially, for, from here down for nine months, I couldn't move at all. But then I did ma manage to rehabilitate to a large extent, but there were some complications. And going a few further years, um, they kept looking at it as orthopedic and it had become neurological, so they had neuropathic pain. Um, so, What is neuropathic pain? Um, neuropathic pain is often experienced by people with spinal cord injuries mm. or uh, from C1 right down. Um, and... And it, it's hard to explain, but for example, if I can say I'm in pain 24 hours a day, really? it's just below a certain level, I tune it out. So you've got to, I mean, and I suppose during that time of rehabilitation, you've had to do a lot of, of internal work to be able to have that brain power, to be able to tune out pain. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because the pain experience is in my right foot and ankle, and it's like electric shocks. But yeah. I have learned how to... Um, how to deal with it. Sometimes I do very complex intellectual research yeah. and other times if it's very bad I just go into very deep meditation and that enables me to wow. cope with it. That just shows the power of the mind. Absolutely. So how fully rehabilitated are you now? How mobile are you? I know that you use what you call a Harley Davidson. Yes, Tell us my, about that. my Harley. <laughs> my, my ever, ever living Harley, it's part of my accessories, my phone, my pashminas and my Harley. And I must say there's no indoor speed limit, which is a <laughs> definite benefit. <laughs> and as well as that, I get indoor valet parking. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> How many other people do you know that get indoor exactly. valet parking? Exactly. So when was that period of your life then that you decided that you were going to be an accidental author. <laughs> How did that happen? Well, it, it really was accidental. 
And when I realised it was accidental, then I became a reluctant writer. Oh, yeah. But eventually I realised writing had found me irrespective of my reluctance. Was it after your re rehabilitation that yes, you decided yes, to start writing? Yes, it was. Okay. Um, I'd done other forms of writing. I used to provide training. Mm. So I'd done a lot of training course materials and PowerPoints manuals. And then, yes, and a bit of uh, copywriting website content bulk emails and all that type of thing. Um, and then everyone keeps saying to me, write a book, write a book. So I'd gone from one crutch, two crutches, several neurosurgeries, and then a manual wheelchair, and then the Harley. And everybody said, we can't lift the Harley. It's 50 kgs. You have to write a book. So this is what I did. OK, and then this was the book, Seven Tried and Tested Triangles. What are these triangles? What is this about? The triangles normally denote change as a change process. So, for example, my first chapter is Maslow, the father of triangles, yeah. as that was my first triangle when I was in first year of university. Yeah. And that got me started on the triangles because with Maslow's hierarchy, I've, I've sort of found a way of motivating myself and, and a lot of ways of how to look at life slightly differently. Because yeah. with a hierarchy, you don't have to go one, two, three, four. You can jump a few, but you've got to be very tenacious. Exactly. And then there's other triangles. For example, uh, chapter two is what makes you tick. Yes, I wanted to <laughs> ask you about that. What makes you tick? Now, that's something that I think is really important to myself, and I think maybe a lot of, a lot of our viewers out there as well. Why is it important to know what makes you tick? It's very important because it, in, in, on a personal note, it may affect your choice of career, study, whether you're going to be an entrepreneur or a corporate person. And it's, it's also very good to know because then you can introspect into yourself and then you can understand yourself. But what's of even more use is that you can then look at other people and you can start seeing what makes them tick. And that is, that is a very useful tool because if you know what makes them tick, the, com the communication process tends to go very smoothly and it just makes for a happy, happy relationship. So essentially, I think the seven tried and tested triangles, I mean, would it marry what you feel internally and almost like a self-help book, but then also in turn help yourself in business? Yes, it, it, it is about personal life skills and that. It's also about business and competitive advantage. Um, uh, also another thing I'm passionate about is um, innovation. So there's quite a lot of innovation in there. And for people that don't like to read, there are a lot of pictures and <laughs> you can just go through them quickly. Um, and then I find often people who don't like to read when they see the pictures, then they actually read the book. Yeah, I read um, a review actually on your book and they said, you know, it's usually self-help books are quite tough to go through and sometimes mm. you've got to read through, through things or read over things over and over again to somehow process mm. that information. But they said with this one, it was really quite easy to get through and really did help. I want to ask... Is there a correct way of reading a self-help book? I mean, how can I get the maximum benefit out of it? Do I sit with a pen and paper and kind of answer those questions for myself? Or do you just read it and let it kind of sink in? It's very different for each person. Some people actually start and they go through the whole book and they take leave off work to finish it. <laughs> and other people go very slowly and they go through each little thing. But a lot of people that have it have read it three or more times yeah. because they just keep going back to it, yeah. either very slowly or very quickly. Well, such a pleasure to meet you. I'm really looking forward to reading this book. And, of course, details on how you can get your hands on the seven tried and tested triangles will be on our website as well. Now, we've spoken to three incredibly talented and vastly different authors on the show. And today we are giving away two hampers containing the Chlomu series. That's all three books. The Yearning by Hohale Mashigo and The Seven Tried and Tested Triangles by Pearl Siegel. Now, that's five books in total. To enter, SMS the keyword books, your name and city to 33728. SMSs cost 1 Rand 50 and T's and C's apply and, of course, can be found on afternoonexpress.co.za. After the break, we take a trip to KZN to catch up with former model turned fashion industry entrepreneur Derek Mflongo. We'll be right back. 
Welcome back to Afternoon Express. We're live on SABC3. We've spoken to three incredible authors today, but now we move our attention to fashion. For the past 11 years, KZN model and businessman Derek Mshongo has built a reputation for mentoring young people in the three fields of fashion, modeling, photography, and styling through his agency, DCAM Productions. We recently caught up with Derek in Durban to see what he's all about. That's the shot, okay. Come, come, come around, let's have a look, let's have a look. I'm from Guamashu originally. I was born and raised there, and there's about eight of us at home, and I'm child number seven. We were raised to respect and remain uh, humble. However, I did not follow the rules. <laughs> Straight after matric, I went into a teacher's college where I started to be a teacher specializing in history and speech and drama. I had started doing some modeling part-time, which my parents were not very fond of. I then moved to Johannesburg, started my modeling career, moved to Cape Town, and then thereafter, everything just went from one step to the other, where I was doing more international campaigns, and when I get back to Durban, I started doing more high fashion events, which again exposed me to more work with designers, makeup artists, fashion photographers, and I gained more confidence. So I chose the angle to then go back to my community, find the models, find the designers, find photographers, makeup artists that needed direction to enter the high fashion space. And that led to me now opening up officially the modeling agency, a production company where we produce fashion shows in a fashion week, high fashion space. And then working with fashion magazines, producing still photography work. Fashion is associated with a lot of drama and temperaments. And I, I bring with me the social development within the fashion space. I chose to strictly represent African, South African models. And that wasn't because of a race issue. It was more the fact that when I was a model, I came from a Zulu conservative family that did not allow this. The dynamics of that is that you are going into this industry without any guidance. So my approach was, I will engage parents, I will engage kids, because I understand their socio-economic dynamics. I understand the language, I understand the culture, so I'm able to take them from the unknown to the known. I never wanted to start the modeling age. I was very clear about that because I was working mostly behind the camera. I didn't know the administration part of the business. However, a lot more of my friends who already had kids, like say, Derek, my child's got potential, please will you help? And that's how then I then responded to the calling that, okay, this is what you have to do. But it has been challenging, and my approach initially was more on the development side of it, not the business side of it. I think as one is more into business, you understand the dynamics. So I would say it was pretty much the response from the people as a model from the township. People look up to you, you, you come across as a role model, and thereby the business model came about. Derek scouted me back in 2012, and I was a bit skeptical of joining the industry. And he made, uh, after getting to know him, he made me warm up to the idea and made me more comfortable with working with him. And I don't regret it one bit. Working with Derek is exceptionally amazing. He's one guy that actually breaks the boundaries. When you're working with him, he makes you think out of the box. And it's just always a grooming process with him. Photography production um, was merely a response to the lack of African photo fashion photographers. I wanted to develop them. I wanted to assist them get into the space. So through doing models portfolios, I will find the photographers that come in and guide them along. I did it because it came from the heart, not because of the business outcomes. If you look at other cultures, you will see how they've translated their culture into business. And I think that is very important for black people to understand who they are and be affirmed in their self, thereby translating that into business outcomes. Derek keeps you on your toes. And um, with him, everything runs according to schedule. So you miss your schedule, you're not gonna get what you're supposed to do. So he makes you aware of how important your job is and you always keep on track of time. The Derek and Tongo brand within the fashion industry is pretty much development. It is very clear, Zulu. My designers are mostly KZN based. They are mostly people who did not go to, through formal education. 
They are people whose work that I've seen on the street or worn by some of the models. And I'll approach them individually and say, you've got an amazing skill, let me help you get into the fashion space. Career highlights, being able to share my successes with the younger kids that need guidance in the industry is the most comforting success that I go to go with every time when I go to bed. All right, now back in the kitchen with lovely Ming. You actually remind me of a butterfly today with your gorgeous <laughs> purple hair. Now, Ming, I have a confession to make, and I'm sure you'll understand. The smell of cooked apples and cinnamon, I mean, really. There's actually this thing that they say if you want to sell your house, boil apples in your house and then add cinnamon, just because that flavor it's just, <laughs> gives just people like this nostalgic it. feeling. It's so no. lovely. No, there's just something wonderful about apple pie in general. Exactly. That it just it makes you want to go towards it and have yourself a bite. So we've broken up our honeycomb. Yes. During the commercial break, I did have a tendency to eat the majority of it, but at least <laughs> we thankfully still have some in the bowl, thank goodness. And now we're going to add it to that apple pie that you're going to teach me how to make. Yes, so um, you can actually add it to any pie, any tart, any mm -hmm. form of anything, as long as you can sprinkle it like a topping, which exactly. is always fun. But we're going to make apple pies just because it's fun to oh, apple let pie, me, right? Let me learn how to make them <laughs> apple pies. So um, what I like to do is, if you don't actually have the time to make something from scratch, um, store pastry is a fantastic thing to use, um, puff pastry. So all you need to do is you cut out your discs. One, two, and three, four, <laughs> five, and six. So you cut out your discs. Yeah. And you pop them onto the tray. Okay, I'll help you. Thank you. There you go. So, a bit dusty and fluffy. Yep, all good. Okay, and then so, <laughs> then afterwards you're going to make the apple mixture for the top. So what you need to do is you need to get your apples, green apples. Okay, well you would switch the stove on first. That <laughs> would make sense. There you go. And um, then you have your apples as well as your sugar, and cinnamon. The and best. The best. The best, best combination. Best. And mm. you kind of just like let it go for a little while so that all the sugar melts. And then after all the sugar melts. Um, you will get this wonderful, lovely... That's all it is? I mean, you hardly even mix that. You hardly even that, mix Okay, that. amazing. And you just let it go. So then what you would do afterwards is you'd actually just lay out the apples on top. So you can cut your apples in any way you want. Um, I like to do nice chunky wedges because then you get some meaty, you know, apples in the mix. Mm, exactly. Yeah, so you can cut them into little blocks, you can cut them into slices, thin slices, but, you know, let's try them out like And this. I suppose you can add anything. I mean, what else usually goes into apple pie? Raisins. Um, yeah, you can add raisins. You can add... Um, uh, I also like to add cherries into the mix sometimes. Oh, yes. Right? That's what Gee, you're awesome. invited to dinner at my <laughs> house if you're cooking. <laughs> um, and so you just pop this into the oven at 180 degrees for about 15 minutes or so. Um, but then the next best thing after you take them out they come out like Ta-da! Eat your heart out, Martha Stewart. <laughs> We've already done it. Okay. So, so here you go. So now what I like to do in, in addition to that is I like to add some whipped cream yes, to it. Yes, you have to have cream. Which is always, always yummy. Mm -hmm. So now what I like to do is to take a vanilla pod just to butterfly it and to get the vanilla seeds out. So when you get the seeds out, look how gorgeous that but is. But I mean, what is the, are those the seeds? Or those, those are tiny seeds. little things? Yes, okay. those are the seeds and that's what you want to get out into yes. your cream. So just to scrape out a little bit, just to chuck it in and then just to give it a mix into it. Is that just that little bit of vanilla? It's so strong, so oh, beautifully great. potent and powerful. It's, and then you also get to see the little black specks in between, which is always fun as yeah. well. So then you get a nice mix through and then dollop on top. Of your beautiful little pies. There you go. Okay, and then I'm guessing the last phase of this is my job. Would you like to do the final touches? I mean, this is just so much fun. And you can put a lot on here. Yeah, as much as you want. There you go. I'm <laughs> going to make them quite busy because I think chunky, rustic apple pies mm. with honeycomb, honeycomb, honey. This is so good. <laughs> Look at that. I mean, really, this is just... Are <laughs> you going for it? No, eh? I'm thoroughly <laughs> enjoying no stopping this. You. <laughs> because I know I'm going to get to eat them a little bit later. How's that? And Chunky enough for you. There you go. Honeycomb on top of little apple tartlets with a little bit of whipped cream. And that 
is dessert. Remember, you too can find this all on afternoonexpress.co.za. Shopping lists and, of course, this delicious recipe. Thank you, Ming. It's a pleasure. For I... bringing this beauty into my life. I hope you enjoy it. How oh, wonderful. We're going to be right back after Thanks. this. <laughs> Welcome back to Afternoon Express on 3. Now, just another reminder that the days are counting down and it's less than a week left until the start of the third season of Winner Home right here on Afternoon Express. Follow our three young designers every weekday from the 16th of May as they turn three empty apartments into dream homes with expert colour advice from Plascon to create on-trend living spaces and luxurious Caesar stone surfaces all at the award-winning Val de Vie Estate, conveniently located in the gorgeous Cape Winelands. Now, enter the grand uh, prize competition on privateproperty.co.za and you stand a chance to win one of the completed apartments. I mean, what a prize. Win a Home is proudly brought to you by Private Property in proud association with Nedbank. Wow, what a prize indeed. Yeah. Here. And earlier on, we wanted to know what book should everyone read once in their lifetime and why? And some of your responses were, Sabera Saeed said... I'd read Take My Heart by Marie Higgins because it shows us how people can deceive you, even someone as close as your family. Never view things at face value. Ooh, wow. spicy. <laughs> then uh, Rizwana Ali says, Daniel Steele's Wings seems to be my all-time favourite. It clarifies the term, if you love something, let it go. And if it's meant to be for you, it'll always find its way back to you. Books help you live in a different time and situation. It's amazing how you can transform into anything just with a little imagination. Wow. I love reading. Yeah. What have been the biggest books in your life? Like, what had the biggest impact? Well, I've... I've... I read a lot. I used to read a lot before I started writing. And, uh, but the best books would be the books I, I, I read in high school because they inspired uh, the way I write. Yeah. Books like To Kill a Man's Pride, oh, uh, Winners. Wow. And I don't think I've found any books that are I are loved better. To Kill a Man's Pride. Yeah. We're just going to take a quick phone call. We've got Tombi on the line. Hi, Tombi. What's your question or comment? Hi. Um, well, for me... Uh, any book is a readable book because I've learned from my experiences in reading that fiction, novel, or religious books, they all have some sort of advice to gain. Okay? Exactly. So personally, indeed. I've learned quite a lot from my anger management to forgiveness and accepting who I am. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your phone call. You know, there's a lot of young um, emerging authors in South Africa. More and more people are just writing books in, in, in ways that people who've never written books before. So how do we grow readers in South Africa? Because publishers complain that South Africans aren't readers. We Any need more libraries that? and schools. Yeah. That's it. That's how I became a reader. Libraries and schools. Otherwise, my mom would just give me old magazines and be like, stop talking, read this. Just read. Yeah. yeah. So whatever it is, even if it's a newspaper, magazine, whatever, just, yeah. yeah. I think reading is so important. It what, is. What's how, I mean, how do you think people should be encouraged to read more? Um, I think reading is so important, not only for knowledge or information, but also for creativity and problem solving and... You've got to just let it flow. And without reading all the games and that, that you don't have to use your imagination. Yeah. So I yeah. think that reading will give everybody a chance to use their imagination. And from there, they can create or innovate whatever they might like to. And if you can read, you can bake. And I, <laughs> recommend, I really do recommend one of these tarts because they are amazing. I'm going to serve you. Oh, uh, yes. Make sure you join us again tomorrow for Afternoon Express and get here early because during the first 15 minutes of the show, we're joined by a health and safety yes, expert to take a look at how to keep our homes and families safe during the winter season. And for dinner, we're making a beetroot and cauliflower gratin. Lovely. Nice. Sounds yummy. Bonnie, there you go. I definitely oh, thank recommend you. you take one of those. I've been dying to have one. I know. Thank you so much for coming on the show, and I really hope that we've inspired South Africa to read so much more. Certainly. We'll be back again tomorrow, same time, same place. Until then, good night and happy eating. Mwah. Bye. <laughs> coming up tomorrow on Afternoon Express, we chat to health and safety expert Brent Lawrence about keeping our homes safe during the upcoming winter season 
and we look at how to stay healthy during winter from preventing sickness to food that helps build our immune system. Another Feel Good Production. Hi, YouTubers. Thank you so much for watching. Your support means the world to us. Join the Afternoon Express family by subscribing to our channel right here. And we'll keep you up to date with all our recipes and, of course, our fabulous episodes. Also, feel free to leave a comment and share this video. We do love it when you express yourself.